Uh, we'll wait until people <laughs> file up. Richard Rogers uh, from MIT. Uh, Mark Leggett in the back of the room in the brilliant blue um, descending upon us. Um, Simon Waddington and Carissa Smith. No, not but In absentia. <laughs> She was in my right, but I'm not already now. Alright. Hey, you guys ready? Okay. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, DuraCloud in this panel. DuraCloud is an open source platform that was developed by the DuraSpace organization uh, over the last two years. The platform went into production last fall. Uh, it is offered not only for anybody to download and deploy on their own campuses and organizations, but the DuraSpace organization also offers it offers it as a service, meaning that you could subscribe to DuraCloud and we provide uh, a SaaS model, which is software as a service um, for using DuraCloud. So what we're here uh, to talk about today in the panel are really three uh, very different use cases, but all focused around preservation uh, using DuraCloud. So the first up, I believe, is Rich Rogers, who's going to talk about um, deploying DuraCloud at MIT, where he's using the, the SAS mile, but really for preserving his DSpace repository. Next up will be Mark Leggett at Discovery Garden, and he is going to talk about, is Mark here? Yes. Okay. He is going to be talking about deploying DuraCloud as a service for multiple Islandora repositories. So deploying it at scale for, uh, as, a, as a solution for preservation support. And the third speaker, Simon, will be talking about a hybrid cloud model where they looked at DuraCloud with iRods for providing local and cloud-based storage backup with preservation services laid on top. And his was more of a research project but did have some interesting outcomes that we'd like to share. Okay, with that, I will hand it over to Richard to begin. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, we participated, we at MIT Libraries uh, participated in uh, several uh, pilot programs uh, in which the DuraCloud services were defined and refined. Uh, the initial one provided uh, basic storage capabilities and some services. There was a follow-on pilot, which I won't describe much in this talk, uh, around provisioning uh, video content, which has particular challenges due to size and uh, accessibility. Uh, so we had, uh, we had quite broad experience interacting with the DuraCloud uh, SaaS as it, as it grew up. And I will describe, what I'll describe here are not any technical details, but largely what the effort was to, to do an integration between a repository platform and a service like DuraCloud. So our, our core use case, which I certainly will not belabor here since you've heard two hours of uh, preservation gospel, uh, <laughs> is that the service at base provided uh, a, uh, a, a geo-distributed uh, replication uh, system. And, uh, and that was our use case. We had IR content that was not terribly well served from, from a replication standpoint. Uh, the, uh, it was also important that w we address concerns not just around bit rot, but wh what I'm calling uh, administrative failures. Uh, and that, in that actually raises very interesting design considerations when you uh, interact uh, with a service like this. You have to make sure that administrative failures aren't propagated through the replication network, uh, which is surprisingly easy to do. Um, Further, we found from a repository standpoint, uh, there's a very fine line between having a, a highly automated process, which it has to be. It can't be elective or there'll be too many mistakes made. But on the, on the other hand, being visible. I mean, I'm reminded of that, uh, the delightful Reagan-era 
oxymoron, trust but verify. That really is what, <laughs> that really is what preservation uh, practice is like. You need the system to transparently and reliably uh, engage with the service, but at the same time provide repository managers and others the ability to, to verify that uh, it, it's acting as, as intended. Um, and therefore, we developed a set of tools in, in, in DSpace, in this case, geared towards collection and collection managers, repository managers, where they could, where they could verify that the system was working. And of course, it has to be cost effective, simple to operate. And I won't, again, belabor too much uh, the value proposition that DuraCloud had for us, but it was, uh, it provided a single convenient point of service interoperation. Uh, we, I, I believe many of you are familiar with the, how the, the DuraSpace service works. But it basically fronts from a technical and business standpoint and gives you an abstraction to multiple backend uh, services. And that's important because that means we do not, that the individual repository uh, doesn't need to engage in bilateral uh, agreements with multiple uh, cloud vendors. Uh, it also provides very uh, straightforward tools and APIs for integration with systems. Uh, at least during the course of uh, our work with them, and I believe this is still the case, there was great high bandwidth access to their developers so that we could, uh, we could do integrations very smoothly uh, and cleanly. And finally, and this was important, uh, the DuraCloud folks did a lot of hard work to design on the business model side to, d to design a service that was friendly to uh, higher ed institutions, it's, and which is also not easy to do, I might add, because many storage and I.O. costs can be quite volatile in this space. And they, they, there's a mismatch between that and standard uh, uh, bidding and budgeting processes in, uh, in research institutions. And so again, the DuraCloud service gives you a good, uh, a good clean interface uh, against such volatility. So what were the challenges as we tried to integrate? Well, one, uh, one immediate challenge is that it's not obvious how you want, how a repository system should construct the archival units themselves. Uh, repositories deal with a lot of files. Some of them are uh, content files. Some of them are metadata, right? It's not clear that you want every atom of the repository system to have a, a correlated archival unit that's pushed around and replicated. Uh, so one of the first and obvious decisions was we decided to create as archival units, uh, so-called AIPs, archival in information packages, which put together the metadata and, uh, and content files. And those are the units of replication uh, in the system. And that's completely transparent to DuraCloud. That's all done at the repository level. I mentioned before that the repository managers need to be able to look into the system to some degree. So we created, we created tools and integrated them into the administrative user interface of DSpace to allow actually direct auditing of the content in, in DuraCloud. You could, you could select either collections of objects or individual objects and query the system and, and actually recompute and compare checksums uh, on demand uh, if needed. Uh, there were also a lot of issues uh, with scale, uh, which, are, which are surprisingly hard. Some files are quite large, and they don't lend themselves to uh, interactive uh, use. If you, want to, if you want to trigger an operation, a uh, replication operation, it might take too long to be really done comfortably in a, a regular web interaction. So we had to build queuing systems for large files so that, so that requests could be made and then asynchronously fulfilled. Um, and we also wanted to, again, make, make it autom automatic, but uh, but detectable. And then finally, a very interesting case uh, is the question of deletions. And I mentioned before, what you want uh, in a preservation system is not for uh, administrative errors to, to defeat the purpose of the, of the replication system. So we had to design a system where if a local deletion was made in the repository, that was actually not, that instruction was not carried out to, to the replicas. Uh, so 
That's what I mean by a logical delete. At the time a deletion occurred, what we would actually do is prepare a manifest of what was locally deleted and store that in the replica, so in the replication network. So we knew exactly what was locally deleted. If that ended up being an administrative mistake, we could, uh, we could pull it back uh, and, and restore it. So there were a lot of uh, and ad hoc auditing and so forth. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time. But anyway, those, those were a lot of the main issues. Uh, the, uh, the code, I will say, that we did for the pilot uh, has since been refined somewhat. It is now available for later versions of DSpace uh, as an add-on, uh, as a so-called replication task suite. Um, I, I believe it's in use uh, fairly widely in the DSpace community, uh, and so we, we continue to refine it and encourage its use for people uh, engaging in replication with their cloud. So, thanks. Thanks, Richard. And I would echo uh, the comments Richard made about the referring to the kind of the, the complexity and some of the issues that you need to consider when you're doing this. And by extension, the, the nice uh, or the valued service that uh, uh, JuraSpace provides with the Jura Cloud service. So we've we had the same experience that Richard referred to in terms of very responsive um, uh, re uh, a very good response from uh, the Jurispace team as we were doing our, our test. Um, so Islandora, uh, just a quick, uh, quick slide for those that, that don't know, the Drupal plus Fedora framework that we've developed uh, being deployed in a lot of institutions and uh, increasingly uh, Discovery Garden as a commercial service provider for Islandora is increasingly getting uh, 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 desires from our clients to provide that preservation uh, service. So in addition to adding uh, the kinds of things that they would expect such as uh, standard premise records and, and that kind of support in the Islandora framework, uh, we also consider JuraCloud a, a natural extension uh, of what we provide in Islandora. Uh, so our current project, and I uh, apologize to uh, Jura space for adding another Jura term. Uh, this one that does not exist, Jura sync, is, is of course Cloud sync. <coughs> so that was a mistake in, uh, in having Jura. I guess it was a problem with my Jura matter. <laughs> um, so uh, our goal is to maintain the context of individual objects uh, and or the collections that we are, uh, people have in Fedora and to provide them with a single button restore uh, of unmatched or damaged assets if that can in fact be determined from uh, the copies and, and Richard kind of referred to uh, some of the issues with whether or not you can automatically restore an asset based on the multiple copies that you have or whether it requires uh, somebody to do a little bit more manual checking. Um, so we certainly provide both options. Uh, I think the the one, the one approach that we uh, did not consider was uh, automatically re uh, recovering any asset without giving you the option to determine whether or not that was an appropriate step. Uh, we also, as uh, Michelle mentioned, uh, because uh, JuraSpace provides the option of using the, uh, the service from uh, JuraSpace to uh, uh, purchase the Jura Cloud service through them uh, or to uh, build your own kind of private uh, Jura Cloud a service or network, uh, so Islandora will support both approaches. Uh, so we've got a, an initial release up and running. Um, if you're familiar with the, the new Islandora 7, we, take, we make use of the Islandora 7's new manage uh, tab functionality. So there's a new component in there called the vault. And I should point out that Donald Moses, who can put his hand up in the back there, Donald <laughs> Donald's a little shy. Donald uh, is here and he has worked with Paul Pound, who was the original Islandora developer to put together the, uh, the initial version. Uh, so it provides full access to the Jura Sync and, and uh, Jura Cloud and Cloud Sync uh, services. Uh, it's um, accessible, as I mentioned, through the Islandora. This is the configuration panel for Islandora. Uh, the second one from the top is called the Islandora Vault. So that's where you would go in to 
manage the settings for your particular Jura Cloud account. You can integrate it directly with your Jura Space um, enabled service where you get Jura Cloud directly from uh, Jura Space, or you can do it through a service provider like Discovery Garden. And we provide all, our cl all of our clients with a service where we do all of the setup and, and uh, acquisition of the Jura Cloud service um, through Jura Space and manage it on their behalf. So there's a fairly simple setup. Uh, and then once you go into the Manage tab, either at a collection level, our new collection manager function allows you to access these functions at an individual collection level or object level. So on the upper right there, you can see the, the Vault uh, button. So that gives you access to the functions that allow you to create the tasks or run the tasks uh, that kick off Cloud Sync and, and have the, uh, the replication take place based on the configurations that you've set up uh, in Jura Cloud. So here in this example, you see the ability to copy the collection from Fedora to Jura Cloud and also to restore from Jura Cloud to Fedora. So we decided to provide that option to use it, the service as a restore for a complete collection. Uh, this is an example of um, the creation of a CloudSync task uh, to run a particular uh, operation. Uh, this is uh, uh, a view of whether or not the, the task was successful and the ability to, uh, to view uh, the report. Uh, and here's an example of um, the ability to modify uh, the query that you is used to create the, uh, to pull and create the list of PIDs that, that get synced uh, in the task, um, which your cloud data store, you run it against, and all those kinds of uh, details. Uh, so here it indicates that the backup task has started. Uh, right now we just say check back later. Um, but we'll have an appropriate communication uh, workflow that sends a message to the manager when the, the task has been completed with a link to the report. Um, here's an example of a, the view of a, an object. Uh, in the, this particular Fedora, and you can see the traditional uh, list of Fedora uh, data streams and their properties. And over on the, the very left-hand side, you have the vault column. So this is the one that indicates which assets have been replicated to cloud and which ones uh, either mass match <coughs> or have a mismatch. So our goal here is when you go to an object or you get a report and you click on a link, uh, that indicates there was a mismatch uh, that you were able to go to uh, the particular object, click on the um, on the button, and restore the data stream from the cloud uh, as appropriate. And of course, the option would be to manually check the assets to determine uh, which is the appropriate action to take. So our goal is to integrate Jura Cloud and the services that it provides, and also, of course, Cloud Sync. Uh, which um, we're much appreciative for. It's a very useful tool, well designed, and as Richard said, uh, fully considers the, the business requirements uh, of the institutions and a commercial service provider like um, Discovery Garden in helping our clients uh, preserve the assets that they are serving up. So our goal with uh, the next uh, step, so we actually have four or five uh, clients who have decided to go with the Jura Cloud uh, service, so they'll be our first uh, test cases. One has a collection of, um, I forget how many assets there are, but it's about a 10 terabyte uh, Fedora collection with a range of object types. Uh, so it'll be a good test of uh, the service and some of the issues, again, that Richard had highlighted with their, uh, their testing. Um, of course, I mentioned the automated recovery, and uh, the one goal that we're um, looking to implement later this year is support for the private Jura Cloud uh, instances and also the hybrid approach uh, where you may have assets stored in both the standard uh, Amazon Rackspace uh, Jira Cloud service or in a private uh, Jira Cloud accessible uh, a cloud configuration. And that's it.
So I'll, I'll talk briefly about the uh, Kindura project, which was um, funded by JISC. It ran um, during 2011. In fact, for very staffing issues, we actually finished the project around March, this end of March this year. Um, it was an exploratory project. Um, the partners were King's College, the lead, um, King's College London, the Sci STFC, the Science and Facilities Technology Council, and uh, Juraspace. So what we were interested in particularly was preservation of research outputs, data, and documents. Um, as be, has been mentioned in several talks already, um, those, th the preservation of research data is not well catered for by institutions. However, there's a changing landscape, and uh, many funders are actually requiring now that, that research data is kept for periods of 10 years or more. So it's quite a, a, a relevant and uh, pressing problem. And very often, IT departments and institutions don't have the capacity to actually um, support this. Be I mean, partly due to the long lead times it, it takes to actually deploy um, storage within institutions. So the solution we used, uh, looked at was um, based around hybrid cloud. So uh, commercial clouds so or third-party cloud services provide, a, in some sense, an quite an attractive option for storing uh, research data. They're elastic, they can be deployed very rapidly, and the costs are, are, are pretty transparent. However, there are some risks if you're using public cloud like Amazon, for example. If you have sensitive data, um, you may not want to store it in a public cloud. There's obviously data protection laws to protect uh, personal information, which can't, in, certainly within the, uh, in the UK, that data can't be moved outside the EU. And there's also, also risk of loss of service or, or service availability, which could be an issue as well. So in contrast, in-house storage is obviously fully um, under internal control, but it's, it's, it's quite inflexible. It um, has quite long lead times to deploy. So what we are looking at was a hybrid solution where we combined together uh, both commercial cloud storage and internal storage. Um, obviously, the, that allows uh, some more, in some sense, that allow, also allows us to use internal storage more flexibly, but there's obviously a cost of, of higher complexity. So, um, the, what we actually built in the project was a proof of concept uh, uh, repository for research data. We used both commercial cloud, so we used the available um, uh, uh, provide, uh, available um, uh, storage providers that for where there's, there's actually a plugin for Jira Cloud, so that was really Amazon, Rackspace, and Azure. And for internal storage, well, there's also a plugin for iRod, so we, we use that as our internal storage provider, but we did also consider implementing other, other uh, uh, storage um, adapters as well. So we, for the repository we used Fedora Commons, we used that out of the box since we, we had very limited time to do the project. Um, the role that Jira Cloud then provides is, um, plays is then to provide a single interface to all our storage providers. So this, this, this provides quite a, a major simplification and our, our project is slightly different from the other two in that we, um, used, we actually set up our own version of Jira Cloud so we had a, quite a lot of help from Michelle and the um, Jiraspace team in actually uh, installing the, source c uh, the code from source. Um, we actually found it a lot easier to use Windows and we, um, we have actually produced some quite detailed uh, notes on how to, actually, how to actually do that which may be useful for other people who are interested in doing the same thing. And basically what we did then on top of, on top of Jira Cloud, we Im implemented our own management framework to manage the storage of um, data between the different providers. So there were really three uh, questions we, we tried to answer. One is, where, where can the data be stored? So if it's personal data, for example, it, it can't be stored actually outside the EU, so we need to ensure that can't happen. There may be some data we want to keep in-house, so that we prevent it going out to, to a, a third-party cloud provider. Um, the second thing is, how many copies do we want to keep? And that, 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 can be, that really depends on institutional policies. And the third um, criteria then is, um, of the, of the available criteria, which are the most cost effective. So we had a cost model built into the system as well, which could select the most cost effective providers uh, for that particular piece of data. Um, what, we, what we tried to do in the project was imp implement something that was um, as flexible as possible. So we actually used the Jules rules engine to implement the, the decisions about um, both uh, where data can be stored and where, it's, where it could be migrated, so that anyone else could come along and implement their own rules in the system. And similarly for the costing model, we actually stored all the cost information in the spreadsheets. So that's the information about the actual storage cost it's itself as well as the cost of moving data in and out of the storage. 
Um, the, the actual, so the actual system is transparent to the user. So what, what a researcher would do is they'd come along with their data. They would initially enter some data about their project, so who funded it, um, and, and various other criteria. And then for each collection of data they put in, they would enter information about that particular data collection. So for example, it could be source data, or it could just be some intermediate results. And th these influence the, the actual decisions made by the rules engine. But the, the whole point was that the, the researcher doesn't know where their data is stored. It ju they, just, they just see an interface, and it's, and, it's, and it's actually managed by the system using this, using this rules-based approach. Uh, so this is a, just a very, very brief uh, view of the overall architecture. So the system's accessible by a, via a web browser for the user, and there's, there's a interfaces to upload content um, and then view and search the uh, content collections. Uh, the management server uh, contains the, the actual workflows for ingesting and migration of data. Um, that's, that's based on Tomcat. Um, we used a Fedora repository. Um, and our own instance of Jura Cloud, and all those, all those servers, the management server, Jura Cloud, and Fedora repository live locally, and then the storage providers um, are the uh, a kind of external piece. Um, we actually used a, the external reference approach in Fedora, so that we don't actually store the metadata or the Fedora objects in the cloud, we, we store those locally, and we reference the, the actual binary payloads um, in, in the various storage providers. We also integrated, um, as well as uh, I, IROD's Azure, Rackspace, and Amazon, we also integrated the uh, Castor uh, tape store through IROD's. So that gives us another use case of being able to, after a certain amount of time, being able to prompt the user to migrate their data, say, from a high tier storage, expensive storage like disk, to a tape storage. So I think that's it. OK, we'll finish there. So we've got time for questions. Thanks. All right. Uh, questions? We have a question. So this is for Richard. Um, you talked about deletion being an issue and, and you're marking items for deletion but then not actually deleting the replicas. Uh, so what happens if, for example, you get a DMCA takedown notice or some other legal action where you really do need to ensure that the content is removed from the entire system? Yeah. Well, there are a couple of ways. That's a good question. There are a couple. Can you use the mic? Or the desk mic, or is it? Yeah. That's a good question. There are a couple of ways to deal with uh, the, the logical deletions, as I call them. One is you can uh, establish a policy. Av uh, a, a policy to do a, a garbage collect of the logically deleted items after some period of time. So in other words, the assumption would be you would detect a, a, mis a mistaken deletion within a year or six months or whatever your policy was. But two, the, the tool suite does contain uh, the ability to directly address the replica copies in DuraCloud. So in, in the case you described, you have the ability to just go in and, and pick it off. Uh, one by one if, if there was a takedown notice. And you can ensure that the copy set is clean. Follow on. So you had mentioned that the, the logical deletion was to guard against administrative errors. What, Correct. What's to guard against administrative errors in, in that kind of forcing <laughs> deletion? <laughs> uh, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> There's no double. If you do it twice, arguably, you deserve it. <laughs> right. That's a better uh, way of putting it. Experience is the best teacher. Uh, any uh, more questions? So uh, Simon, I had a, a question. Uh, is, uh, the integration of drills as a rules engine is quite interesting. And I, um, I am, don't remember from seeing previous uh, Dura Cloud um, presentations on what the rules policy engine, but it seems like rules probably introduces more, more flexibility for different flavors of rules. And is, is this something that you see potential convergence on or complementarity? Can you comment, or Michelle or Simon, can you comment on the overlaps or the gaps? Um, Into a microphone. Sorry, yeah. yeah, I think uh, 
we, we actually have evaluated several different kinds of rules engines that, are, that we, we could have used in the project. I mean, Jules, Jules is quite a, um, we found one of the easiest to use. It's, it's open source. Um, and it's kind of a natural, when you have multiple storage providers, it's kind of a natural thing to want to be able to do to provide some additional intelligence to the system to actually manage storage of data between multiple providers. So it was, it's quite logical. It's, it's, it's a sep I mean, it's completely separate from the Jura um, cloud code at the moment. But it's clearly, a, it seemed, seemed to us a very useful extension. So I don't know if Michelle would like to add anything to that. Yeah, I mean, this was hopefully a continued effort yeah. that we will, yeah. DuraCloud, one of the nice things is platform, so it's easy to roll in these types of things. But that will be another phase. OK, I'd like to thank all the panelists that came up today to talk about DuraCloud and all of you for withstanding the two hours of presentations. Um, so thanks very much. <laughs>